Just imagine you're out on a date. You're single, of course. You're out on a date with the girl of your dream. She's, she's gorgeous in your eyes. She's witty. Um, she's motivated or you're out, you know, with the, the guy of your dreams. You know, he, he's handsome and he's, he's caring, he's tender, but he's a hard worker. But you're feeling awkward, like, you know, what do I say? I don't want to, you know, trip over my words and you just don't know what to say or what to do next. Well, we want to respond right in the right company, but you know, it's more important that we respond correctly to God, the King and Creator of the universe. How do I respond to God? Listen, find out. Please turn in your Bible to 2 Chronicles chapter 5. 2 Chronicles chapter 5. I want to talk to you tonight about four things that God wants us to lift up. Four things that God wants us to lift up. Our voices, our souls, our hands, and our eyes. Our voices, our souls, our hands, and our eyes. Let's talk about lifting our voices. There's two different areas in particular that I want to speak about. The first being worship, especially singing. Second Chronicles 5 and verse 13 Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud." so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. When we lift our voices and sing, sing to God, especially corporately as we read here, God's presence can come in a very tangible, discernible way. Now, it may not be a cloud, though with the smoke they had in here, it looks like we got a bit of a cloud lingering in the air. But there does come a tangible reality of God that rests upon the heart that can be discerned by an individual. You know, I, I got saved, as many as you know, in a little street mission up in southern Oregon and my best friend at the time, we had done lots of drugs together. We had pursued different Eastern religions together. Um, we were just together all the time. And then I become a Christian. It kind of really upset him. And I said, man, come to church with me. So he says, okay, I'll come. And we go, I bring him to this little Pentecostal church I'm going to. I remember we were in the second row. I'm sure he didn't want to be there, but I like to be up front. And so uh, he came down with me. And we're having a time of worship. And God's presence just came in the building. I mean, I know God was already there. He is omnipresent. But there are times that there is what we refer to as a manifest presence of God. A tangible, discernible presence of God. And it was that way. I began to cry. And God was just so real. The atmosphere was so charged with God's presence. And I turned around and looked at my friend. And there was a look of stark terror on his face. And if I could have read his expression, it would have said, there is something very real happening here. And I'm not ready to change. I'm not ready to deal with it or submit to it. And he pushed me out of the way, went right by me, and he literally ran out of the church as we were singing, ran up the center aisle and ran out. You heard the door slam as he left. He was impacted by the presence of God. Psalm 40 and verse 3 says, He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. 
God's put a song in my mouth. Many will see it and fear. Well, he got that part. He saw something. It means to, to perceive, to discern. And he was afraid. Now, the last part of it, and we'll trust in the Lord, I'm still expecting that to happen in his life. To my knowledge, it hasn't happened yet, but I believe that it will. But he encountered a reality of God that Sunday morning in the church as we were worshiping. All right, the second area that God wants us to lift our voices is in prayer. Look with me in the book of Acts, if you would, chapter 4. Peter and John have been taken into custody because they brought healing to the lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple. There's quite an uproar. The guy's leaping. He's walking. He's praising God. And the religious leaders take Peter. They take John. And it says in verses 17 and 18 of chapter 4 that they severely threatened them not to speak at all anymore in the name of Jesus. And they commanded them not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus. And you come to verse 21, and it says, and they threatened them further. Now, they've already severely threatened them, and then it says they threatened them further. And we pick the story up in verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised or they lifted their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, your God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And then it goes on and gives us the body of their prayer. Come to verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. An instant, miraculous answer to their prayer. My friend, when you are threatened by anything, Lift your voice to God and pray. All right. The second thing that God wants us to lift up is our souls. Psalm 25 and verse 1. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Uh, the context is when he's in trouble. He said, God, I will lift up my soul to you. We won't take the time to go there, but in Psalm 143, verses 3 through 8, we find the same context. He said, I'm persecuted. I'm crushed. I'm overwhelmed. I'm distressed. And in that setting, he says, God, I lift my soul to you. Let us not just lift our prayer to him in times of trouble but let us lift our souls to him as well. How you could look at it, it just means I'm going to lift my life to you. But specifically, we identify the soul as being the mind, the will, and the emotions. So God, I lift my mind to you. I realize your thoughts are not my thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so your ways, your thoughts are higher than mine. I submit my mind to you, and I'm not going to lean to my own understanding. I accept your word as my final authority. I lift my mind to you. I lift my will to you, God. I don't want my own ways. I don't want my own plans. But God, I want your plans for my life. Help my feet land on the pathways that you have prepared for me. And then my emotions. God, I give those to you as well. I'm going to come to you with my joys and with my disappointments. The things that make me glad and the things that make me sad. God, I'm going to lift my trophies to you and my scars. Because you love me unconditionally and you love me eternally. In short, God, I'm all in. I'm not just going to make requests when I'm in trouble and then disappear once the storm subsides. 
He's more than a savior from temporal difficulty and danger. He is God, and he deserves the entire devotion of our soul. So let us lift our souls, our lives to him, as well as just our requests for his help. A third thing we're to lift to him is our hands. And there's three basic times in the scripture that speak of doing this. Look with me, if you would, in Psalm 63. Psalm 63. First, we're told to lift our hands in praise. Psalm 63 and verse 3, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. You know, one of the most common Hebrew words that's translated as praise in our Bible over and over again is the Hebrew word yada. It's actually a compound word. Yad is the Hebrew word for hand. And the second part of that A-H is a shortened form of Jehovah. It literally means hands to God. Just translated as praise in our English Bible. But any, any you know, Jewish person in the ancient world or today that understands the Hebrew language would immediately identify. They would lift their hands and say, Yada, praise to God. I'm worshiping him. I'm submitting my life to him. I am being devoted to him. Psalm 134 and verse 2 says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Lamentations 3 and 41 says, let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven. Secondly, we're told to lift our hands in agreement with his word. I quote to you, Psalm 119, verse 48, my hands will I lift up to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. It's a sign of agreement with his word and of reception of his word. I agree with it and I receive it. Thirdly, we're told to lift our hands in prayer. In the New Testament, 1 Timothy 2.8, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. It's a sign of faith. It's a sign of submission. It's a sign of dependence. Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I desire that men everywhere lift up holy hands in prayer without wrath. Get your anger issues taken care of, and without doubting, you do it in faith. It's a sign, God, I believe you're listening to me. I've submitted my heart and my life to you. He wants us to lift our hands. And then fourthly and finally, he wants us to lift our eyes to see two things. Look with me in John chapter four, if you would. John's gospel chapter four. First, he wants us to lift our eyes to see the harvest. John 4 and verse 35. John 4 and 35. Now, before I read it, let me give the context. Jesus has been speaking to the woman at the well. She's convinced that he is the Messiah. She goes into town where she is. It was a Samaritan town. She says, look, come meet a guy who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And the whole town comes out to see him. So meanwhile, Jesus is conversing with his disciples that have come back with some food, and he sees this mass of humanity moving towards him. And as he looks at this group of hungry people looking for the truth, looking for a savior, coming his way, he utters these words, verse 35, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Jesus said, don't always put the harvest off to the future. The harvest is now. 
And he talks about the person that's, that's reaping and the person that's sowing receives a reward. It's always going to be time for sowing the seeds of the gospel, but it's also always going to be time for reaping the fruit of human souls. And I think many, many of God's people walk daily among the ripened grain of human souls, seemingly oblivious to it, where in so many cases the seeds of his word have been sown, the rain of his spirit has been falling, and it's time to thrust in the sickle and reap. People are open. They're hungry. They are searching. I was talking to a friend the other day. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, he, among other areas of his ministry, he's quite influential in Hollywood among the, the uh, you know, people that are involved in, in acting and, and writing and and producing and, and that whole thing, as well as a, a whole lot of people in the music industry. And so he, he's, he has a real open door from God and has been doing it for many years to, to bring the word of God and the love of Christ into the entertainment industry. And he was telling me about a particular person that I know, I've never met them, but I know of them quite well. Very, very famous musician. And I know from listening to the musician's testimony, who's now a Christian, that they you know, before they're saved, experimented quite profusely with their sexuality, was deeply into drugs, just all sorts of things. And he just finished a concert, and he's going out, he and the, the band, they're getting in a limo, and there was some guys standing behind the gates, and one of these young men standing behind the gates said, hey, Jesus loves you. And he just went ahead and got in the limo, but he said it stuck with him. My friend's telling me this because he'd had the conversation with the man. It just stuck with him. Jesus loves me. Nobody's ever told me that before. Jesus loves me. Some weeks later, he's at a party up in Hollywood. It's, it, it is a, a sort of a, a who's who in Hollywood. A whole lot of A-list actors, a whole lot of very famous musicians and singers are there. And he said he was in this deep, dark depression. This music is playing. He's sitting on the couch. And all of a sudden, the song by Simon and Garfunkel, Mrs. Robinson, came on. Here's to you, Mrs. Robinson. Jesus loves you more than you will know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, you don't listen to secular music at all. <clears throat> he said when he heard those lyrics to the song, he began to cry. And he thought about what the young man yelled at him. Jesus loves you. Sitting on the couch there in the midst of this party, he had an encounter with God, and he got saved from Simon and Garfunkel's song. <laughs> I'm telling you, people are hungry. I was doing a minister's meeting in another country some years back, and uh, I was talking to the, the, the men and women there about our need to change our thinking, because sometimes a single wrong thought can hold us into captivity. The Bible teaches us to take every thought captive. And you can read in Isaiah, God said, you have to discard your thoughts and receive my thoughts before my mercy can touch you. And among other things, I was talking to the, the pastors that were there that we need to discard this thought that people don't want to hear the gospel. I said, that's a thought that's come from the enemy. I said, it'll affect Everything about us, it'll affect our countenance, you know, our, our impetus when it comes to preaching. It'll affect our outreach. I said, people do want to hear. They are hungry. The harvest is ripe. And we need to discard this thought that people aren't ready and they don't want to hear. Well, after the meeting, one of the pastors came up to me. And to say that he disagreed with me would not be accurate. He sharply disagreed with me. And he basically said, Bayless, you're an outsider. You don't know. You don't understand our country. You come from the United States. It may be true there, but it's not true here. You don't know the season we're in. You don't know our culture. You don't know our people. And what you said is not true. People are not ready to hear the gospel. That is not the season we're in. I listened to him very kindly, and it just happened. I was holding a meeting in his city that very night. Another church had opened their doors, and it was on an off night for that church. We'd invited people to come. I said, can you please come out to the meeting tonight? And he didn't come. 
But you know what? The little church was packed. Hundreds and hundreds of people came out. I preached a simple gospel message, gave an invitation. Anyone that wanted to receive Christ, come forward. And that church was jammed with people from side to side, many, many people deep, up there, many of them in tears, embracing Jesus as their Lord and Savior in the very community, in the very city that the man had just got through telling me there's no hungry people. No one wants to hear the gospel. Friend, I'm telling you they do. In some cases, yes, we'll be sowing seeds. We always sow. But we also, we need to have a bag of seeds in one hand and a sickle in the other hand. People, they've been looking for answers and they haven't found it in their new boyfriend or their new guilt girlfriend. They haven't found it in drugs. They haven't found it in alcohol. They haven't found it in religious ritual. They haven't found it in good works. What they're looking for is a person and his name is Jesus. We must lift up our eyes and look for the harvest is ripe. Would you bow your heads just for a minute? I want to pray with you. Father, we want to be ready. We want to see the harvest around us. The men and women we work with every day, they go home to a lonely apartment and to depression. Some of them retreat into a bottle of alcohol. Others retreat into a handful of pills. Others retreat into the arms of a stranger. And you've given us the answer. They need a savior. Lord, we ask you to quicken us and use us to speak a word in season to that one that is weary to bring light to that one that's in darkness. We've been called to hold forth the word of life. God, we just ask you for grace. As we step out and obey, we believe the Holy Spirit will anoint us, strengthen us, and give us the right words. And Father, I pray for every person that is here tonight. Whether they've come with a friend, a family member, or come by themselves, if they don't know you, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them by the power of your Holy Spirit. And may they come into a living, breathing relationship with you, even tonight, if they so choose it. I please nobody looking around. I'm just going to lead the congregation in a simple prayer. This is a prayer where if you will let your heart agree with the words, You'll be inviting Jesus into your life. You'll be putting your trust in him because the Bible declares he did die on the cross for our sins. That which stood between us in a relationship with God has been taken out of the way through his death. He's paid the price. And now the way is open. The channel is open for us to come to God and he will not turn you away. It doesn't matter what you've done or what you failed to do. And I know some that are in here, you've lived some pretty sordid lives. I can say, been there, done that. But he is good. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. Confess him with your mouth as Lord. You'll be saved. I want you to pray with me right now. Tie your heart around the words. Be sincere and God will meet you. Say it out loud after me. Say, oh God. Thank you for sending your son to die for the sins of the whole world and for my sins. Jesus, thank you for suffering in my place. Thank you for carrying the penalty for my sins. I repent. I turn away from sin. And I come to you with all of my heart. I believe you've been raised from the dead. And I ask you now, come into my life. Wash me clean. Give me a fresh start. From this moment forward, Jesus, I will follow you. My life is no longer my own. All I am and all I have 
I place in your hands, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Fantastic. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. I hope that you prayed with us when we just offered that time of prayer with our congregation to invite Jesus Christ into your life. Friend, that's the starting point. That, that changes everything. I gave my life to Jesus in a little street mission in a place called Medford, Oregon, many, many years ago. I had terrible problems with drug addiction at the time and was an alcoholic. And a 12-year-old boy had told me about Jesus in a park. And it's a long story, but I ended up in that street mission where I met God for the first time. I embraced Jesus as the Lord and Savior of my life, and I have begun a journey that has been absolutely amazing. It hasn't always been easy, but God has been with me every step of the way. And you know, He has a plan for each and every one of you that's watching right, right now. It's not a coincidence. I mean, you could be doing anything. You could be watching anything or watching nothing, but you're listening to me right now. Friend, take that as a sign from God that He's interested in you. Yes, your life can change. I mean, change radically. What you haven't been able to do yourself, God can do in you and for you and through you. You have a purpose. You're supposed to be here. And if you'll say yes to His Son, Jesus, you will meet the God who created you, who began to walk with you and talk with you. And my friend, life will change. I'm so glad that you joined me. I'd love to meet with you face to face. This is the next best thing. Till next time, we'll see you. When you support Answers with Bayless Conley, you reach out across your nation and around the world, revealing hope to the lost bringing answers from God's Word to life's deep and most difficult questions. There's no greater gift that you can give than to help somebody else come to Jesus. Today, as a way to thank you for your gift, Bayless would like to send you a very encouraging message on DVD called The Advantage of the Holy Spirit. Again, it's our gift to you, our way of blessing you. Use the information on your screen to contact the ministry with your gift to support this television outreach. I'm just glad the Holy Spirit shows us things to come. And He wants to show you things to come that are pertinent for your life, for your future, for your destiny. Jesus said when He comes, it's one of the things that He will do. I think some of us, our life is just filled with so much chaos and so much noise that the Holy Spirit's voice and His guidance is muffled and we're not sensitive to it like we should be. The Advantage of the Holy Spirit will help you understand the power God has placed in your life so you can live a life that is full and blessed. Take a moment right now to provide your gift. Use the information on the screen to connect. And when you do, please make sure to request your DVD copy of Bayless's message, The Advantage of the Holy Spirit.